what said how i how did i find out i was at home fixing my bicycle listening to the morning news while i was doing it then i heard it on the radio i immediately ran in, ran in from the garage and called my mother before our phone would start in ringing it's very interesting because i think nowadays nobody listens to the radios anymore <laughs> well i do <laughs> i like radios <laughs> and some of his scientific interest is, is a lot but i i would summarize in this way i read that he likes to summarize his activity as applied theoretical chemistry somebody Brand of com computations stimulated by experiments and construction of generalizing model. Professor Borim. Oi? É, o seu slide não está trocando. Ele está parado na primeira tela. Não? Não, ele está... Ele continua Ué. parado só no primeiro slide, onde tem aquele índice. Agora trocou. E agora? Agora está trocando. Ué... So I'm sorry. I, I, I'm going to start again. Okay, this way. No, no, don't start again. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. You so, are using the lecture time. Do you want the lecture? Yes. Do you want? Yes. <laughs> okay. So this is just just to finish. This is what Professor Hoffman was telling us in in 2004. He was here for. Uh, help people to understand how science is important in the Samba School of Rio de Janeiro, the Unidos da Tijuca. So, Professor Hoffman, we are very grateful to you for working so hard to make the world a better place for all of us. Thank you, Professor Hoffman. Thank you very much for accepting this invitation. And during the seminar, I asked the people, please keep your microphone mute the people in Zoom can ask, raising your hand, and the others in YouTube chat just write on the chat. Okay? Thank you very much, and for sorry for the problem with my uh, uh, slides. Okay, so, Professor. Thank you very much. Let me now share, you can share screen. your screen with us. Okay, do you see a red and black slide? Yes. Very good. So if you do not see the slides, please interrupt me. Uh, okay. Okay. So thank you both for the introduction, uh, for Paulo, for showing that picture of Taganic Falls in back of you, a good memory of Cornell and Antonio for inviting me. I did not mean to interrupt your presentation, uh, but I need all the time in the world for my lecture. Um, yes, yes. And uh, just to look ahead, this lecture will last two hours and then uh, there will be a break after about one hour of about five to 10 minutes. Uh, which I will announce for everyone to have a coffee. Um, now, uh, I want to talk to you about chemical bonding. Um, and I can best begin by uh, starting with some, with a quote, two quotations. One was of Charles Coulson, who was a very insightful theoretician. And this is caught from an after dinner talk, not from a written lecture. But he says, will you reflect for a moment on some things that I've been saying? And I'm not going to read it. You can read it as well as I can. It seems to me that a bond between the two atoms is so real, so tangible, that I can almost see it. And then I wake with a little shock for a chemical bond is not a real thing. It is not an observable. And that is behind some of the difficulties in defining it. And then there is Robert Mulliken, uh, who 
in his own way quite consistent with his philosophy, said, I believe the chemical bond is not so simple as some people seem to think. It's been there from the beginning. Uh, so a little bit of history. Uh, it goes back to the idea of an element. It goes, it bypasses one of our founding scientists, Antoine Laurent Lavoisier, because in fact, Lavoisier was not concerned with the idea of a bond or what held things together but he introduced so much more into chemistry. There comes the idea of valence as chemistry progressed and then a real explosion in the middle of the 19th century, which is represented by the work of Cowper, Crum Brown, Butlerov and Kekulé, where people began to draw chemical structures and graphical formulae for compounds especially organic compounds. Then there was a period in 1874 where Van Hoff and Lebel introduced the idea of three-dimensionality, the tetrahedral carbon atom. And then in the time of the First World War, Lewis and Kossel independently began to view the bond as a shared electron pair. Meanwhile, quite separately, we got the first metrics of chemical bonds, how long they were. I'll say much more about that. And that was the beginning of crystallography and chemical crystallography uh, with the work of many. Uh, and then in became came the old quantum mechanics, the new quantum mechanics in 1926. And pretty quickly, the first calculations on the H2 molecule by Heitler in London, and then the development by Pauling, by Mulliken, by Hund of valence bond and molecular orbital theories. You can see something in the books that I've listed below, uh, and we will make the PDF of this available so people don't need to scramble to, to write these down. The, uh, then I want to give you some sense of that middle of the 19th century. So this is 170 years ago. People knew that things were hanging together in some way, associated. They knew that an acetic acid there was carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, but more than that, they knew the proportions of them. But they also got an idea that some groups of atoms hang together, like an O and an H, or a carbon and three hydrogens, but they had no good way to represent it. People did not even agree on whether to write the stoichiometric uh, proportions. They knew eventually that in water there were two, though it took them a long time, that in water there were two hydrogens and oxygen, but they didn't know whether to write the two as a subscript or a superscript. There was no, and, and here you see in six, five, six different representations, I've assembled a collage from the middle of the 19th century. And you see models. For instance, Kekulé in about five years went through three different models, all of which he published on how to represent molecules. For instance, one thing he had was a sausage formula. So at the top, you see the actual model also of a sausage formula for methyl chloride, CH3Cl. So there's a carbon with represented by four steel balls. Those four steel balls are not the atomic weight of carbon. They are the four valences of carbon. And three of them are used to bond to three hydrogens. And one is used to bond to a chlorine. And you have to know that the chlorine is not bonded to the hydrogen in that sausage formula. You quickly get used to these. Up at upper right is a formula for acetic acid. 
you see it? A carbon that's single bonded to a carbon that has three hydrogens on the left, double bonded to an oxygen, and then single bonded to an O, which has an H attached to it. Absolutely correct. But you didn't know how to do it. You, you see the dotted lines. You see in uh, the formula in the middle on the left. Let me see if I can get my, my pointer going. Um, hold on for a moment. No, I have my pointer, but I don't have it. Uh, I was hoping for a laser pointer, but I don't have it. But you can see this formula, all the parentheses. There were even models. So Hoffman, August Wilhelm von Hoffman, no relation to me, had models in 19, 1865, which you see at lower left, which exist to this day, which look just like the models today, except every carbon is square planar and not tetrahedral, because that did not come for another nine years that one got the three-dimensional picture. Here is an, a fun, this is an actually an existing model by Kekule of benzene, of the two, what we would call today the resonance structure of benzene. The four black balls are a carbon. It has a hydrogen, it's single bonded to another carbon, it's double bonded to another carbon. I think you can see that right away. Uh, and that goes on around. And these are the two structures. This doesn't have the six-fold symmetry. He knew nothing about six-fold symmetry at that time, except some substitution patterns. Um, the 19th century is a history of development from what were initially called type formulas. Type here means uh, has uh, its direct Trans, transliteration from German. Uh, it means that uh, toluene, for instance, had a phenyl group and a methyl group. And the type was the phenyl and the methyl, and they were transferable. So you could also get phenol, phenyl OH. And uh, the, as I said, the subscripts, superscripts were not established for a while. It took a good number of years for people to recognize that an OH group of an alcohol could be broken up into an O and an H. And that was then, then you had the individual types. These were replaced by structural formulas. And so after 1865, you had these formulas that you see here, which look not that different from the modern formulas. And then the Lewis structures interpreted those at the time of the First World War as a rep that a line was really a representation for a shared or unshared electron pair. And then Pauling came along with his reinterpretation of the Heitler London valence bond theory and reinterpreted those lines as a quantum mechanical shared electron pair with an associate um, wave function to go with it. The whole story is very interesting from a philosophical point of view. First of all, what you see here is representation. These are people who know that carbon and hydrogen or whatever the atoms are, are connected to each other, that they go through the reactions, maintaining that connection or trading connections. Uh, and they need to represent that going along. And you saw the formulations, how, come, how interesting they were in their time. Representation, uh, this is a province of semi-iotics, representation is either iconic or symbolic. For instance, an iconic representation is a no smoking sign, okay? A symbolic representation is at the top in what it is in Europe. And at the bottom, the E is there in Brazil. 
uh, and it really makes a difference when you park there, whether, uh, whether that bar is there or not. Maybe you remember the bar as being uh, iconic, standing for forbidden, but to an American, that European symbol certainly has no meaning whatsoever in its identity, in its initial, uh, in its initial symbolism. In the same way, from the beginning in chemistry, there was a mixture of symbolic and iconic representations. The six and the five in a phenyl group are iconic. They really do stand for weight relationships and under them are the atomic weights, which began to be formulated from the beginning of the 19th century and pretty well formulated by the middle. The symbols themselves, carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, of course, are symbolic. Uh, our students learn very quickly that carbon atoms don't have a C painted on them, okay? So they, are, they stand for something, but you have to agree on what they stand for. So the whole evolution here is complicated, and what complicates it is something which in philosophy has a name, but it's not generally known, uh, and that is reification. Reification is a fancy word for becoming real in the mind, okay? So you think there is a line between an O and an H in an alcohol. If you ask the chemist in the middle of the 19th century, what does that mean? They would tell you that those are associated with each other. They would make zero speculations about a distance or the strength of the bond or anything else. But with time, my friend Emily Grossholtz, a philosopher and poet has called reification simply the things become the furniture of the mind. That is, they take a real shape in our minds. And that is what happened in, with those lines. They became solid. They became lines of some sort. And now there is more because the further development is not just the idea that they became solid, but it's really a story. It's a fascinating story of how tools and concepts change. It is a story of not of a revolution, but gradual punctuated evolution. And along the way, our appropriation of ideas, that the electron pair was once identified as a line, as a bond, of co-option, of parallel and ambiguous terminologies, this, is, this was done in the 19th and 20th century. It was never malicious. It was very human and mostly productive, even as it was confused. Okay, so that's very important for me philosophically in the context of chemistry in general. In terms of philosophies of science, it's not that of Kuhn, it is not quite as uh, chaotic and um, anarchistic as Paul Feyerabend would have it. Maybe it's very much like Peter Gallison, who has some ideas about how science evolves. I could talk, tell you more about it, but what we have today is a reasonably persistent connection between atoms as a definition of a bond. And boy, does this not satisfy some people because the words are vague, reasonably persistent, but every word here has meanings. And I'll try to get you some of those meanings by the time we're done. What I'm going to do in the first hour is to tell you about ways of probing bonding experimentally. And in the second hour, I'll tell you about doing it theoretically. And experimentally, we get distances from various methods we get dissociation energies of the bonds, we get force constants, we can get the density of electrons in a bond, we can probe it magnetically and spectroscopically, 
And lately there are techniques of scanning tunneling microscopy and atomic force microscopy of which I'll say some, some things. We cannot go back in time entirely. So I must start with what we know today. And this is that there is a potential energy typically for a diatomic molecule, as you see here. And quantum mechanically, there is a potential energy curve with an attraction and then a repulsion. And the motions of the two atoms are quantized. There are molecular vibrations. So there are, uh, the, and there is a zero point energy uh, for the vibrations. And there are different ways of defining both the dissociation energy and the force constant and uh, also the bond length of a molecule, which we are aware of that every method that you use, and chemists learn this more or less well, every method you use to determine any of these experimental quantities is subject to some averaging, which depends on the conditions of the experiment the time of the experiment, the time scale, and also uh, the temperature and also the pressure. So on the variation of the physical observables, but we can get at it from this idea of a potential energy curve. So let's talk about distances first. So here is what's happened in the last, in the last, uh, 50 years, at, well, actually long, longer than that, but the evolution, I'll tell you in the last 50 years, there are machines you can buy an X-ray diffractometer, which if you have a single crystal, I'm talking about a discrete molecule. If the molecule cooperates by crystallizing and a lot of effort is spent on crystallizing, uh, you can get a diffraction pattern, which you see at upper right, and from the diffraction pattern, you can get a, um, a, dense, a map of the electron density, which is sketched at the bottom, not for the same molecule. And then you can get the kind of a picture which you expect to see at lower uh, of a molecule. Here, it happens to be an organometallic molecule of nickel with two nickel centers in it. Uh, the cost of these machines has gone down uh, to of the order of $100,000 or so. Uh, and the time with the computer systems that have become available to get the structure has changed from uh, six months, uh, about 60 years ago when I began research, to about a half hour uh, from the time that you take the crystal over, you mount it to the time that you have the full structure. And it can, be, it can go quicker than that even. But this is what we have. And um, I'll tell you in a while how many of these we have. Well, I tell you here, uh, supposing you want to know the length of a CC bond and you mean, uh, a, a saturated bond, meaning a single bond, meaning a bond between carbons that are bonded, let's say, to three other groups each and then bonded to each other. So today, if you wanted to know that, it would be a mistake to go to a theoretician. What you need to do is to look in the Cambridge Structural Database, where people have agreed for 60 years to deposit new structures. The database is now a problem because people are not depositing structures anymore. But here is a friend, Jay Siegel, did this just be, after I talked about this in the seminar. And he said, he went into the Cambridge Structural Database. Uh, here you see how many structures are in there. So let me give you the overall picture. Chemists in 200 years of frenetic activity, have characterized about two to three million well-characterized, sorry, 
about 150 million well-characterized molecules. Well-characterized has to be defined, but they, uh, and there's a problem. My DNA is a molecule, your DNA is a molecule, it's a different molecule, neither is well-characterized, but you can get that DNA uh, characterized. Anyway, of those 150 million, about 1.2 million, about 1%, have had their crystal structure done. And their coordinates are in a Cambridge structural database, an incredible repository of structural information. And there are about 2000 neutron structures. There are a few electron refraction structures. There are a few others, but most of them are X-ray crystallography. So you go into that structure, Jay Siegel did, and you ask, give me, the compounds that you have, which have two carbons, each bonded to three other carbons and are bonded to each other. And the crystal structure answers you and says, boy, you don't want to see those because I've got about 17 million such distances. Do you really want to see all of them? Do you have the money to download them? It asked that structure. So Jay said, give me the first 10,000. And that's what you see here. Here you see 10,000, the first 10,000 structures. And what you see is that this, now, what you should know is some of these structures that people have submitted to the Cambridge Structural Database are good ones. Some of them are lousy ones for whatever reason, when you have 1 million of them, it doesn't matter. If you have an intelligent human being, they'll recognize the lousy structures uh, among those as outliers in this game. And so you see that the bond length is 1.53 angstrom. You also see incidentally that there are slightly more on a long, distance side than there are on the short distance side. That comes from the potential energy curve uh, that you saw. That's not an accident. That's actually some physics being displayed for you. And in fact, the Cambridge Structural Database is an absolutely incredible repository of inspiration for theoreticians because it has it has facts in there as far as distances are concerned. I could go on for a while and I'll show you one, but let me show you something more complicated than CC bonds. Here is iodine iodine bonds. One of the amusing things, the Cambridge Structural Database had a rule from the beginning, they wanted to have organic structures. So they said, you have to have one carbon, one hydrogen in your structure. So the I2 molecule, is not in the Cambridge Structural Database. But some I2 molecules are. How did they get in there? That's because they co-crystallize with some organic stuff. And so you've got co-crystals of I2 with some organic molecule. That's the little one here, 2.66. So what you see here is a wider range of distributions and one, what are those various peaks? Well, one of them is I2, which is two points. Here's the structure of I2 itself at low temperatures, 2.66 angstrom. Incidentally, if you want to know what is the Van der Waals distance, iodine to iodine, don't ask a theoretician. Look in the Cambridge Structural Database. You will see here, for instance, in the I2 structure, which is not in there, it's in another database, you see the next nearest neighbor contacts, so 350 and 427, those are Van der Waals contacts. I'll say in just a moment something more about Van der Waals. Uh, many of the, a big peak in these are I3 minus structures. These are centered at 2.9 angstroms. They're all linear triiodide. There are a few thousand of these. Um, of these structures and they, and they, I could tell you about the bonding that's in the second hour 
Uh, here are some more of the molecules. There are polyiodides. There is a good review on these. These other structures with intermediate bond lengths here are usually polyiodides. The big peak here, uh, the first peak is I2 coordinated in various ways. The second peak is, tri is triiodides. So there are all kinds of different little bonding things in there. What I want to show you is one of the most creative explorations of the Cambridge Structural Beta Database I know, and what I think is one of the best scientific papers of the last 10 years. This is by Santiago Alvarez in Barcelona, and it's called a cartography of the Van der Waals territories. So here is what Alvarez did. He concentrated in his first paper on bonds to oxygen, okay? So he went into the structural database and he asked it for the bond lengths to oxygen of 90 elements of all the things in that database, okay? I show you two of these. This is strontium oxygen, this is rhodium oxygen. Inorganic compounds are going to generate those, but maybe some organometallics as well. So each of these has a peak at low distances, 2.9, 2.4 for these, uh, which are the coordination environments of ionic and organometallic rhodium or strontium oxygen compounds, uh, which uh, are actually bonded to each other in a dative or ionic uh, way. Then you see this rising background here. What are those? Those are non-bonded strontium to oxygen, rhodium to oxygen. So around each oxygen, let's around each rhodium, there is an oxygen of a coordinated molecule. That's the short distance at 2.3. But further away is some oxygen, which is an alcohol or an aldehyde in some organometallic ligand and these, they behave, uh, this, they, they form, there are many of them. They are occupying a shell of thickness that goes as R squared. You can find how many they are. That's the background that you see here, this line here. That's the distant shell. If you like to think about it, a frozen in solvent shell. And then you see in, almost all of them, you see this little peak here. This is not a theoretical result. This is the, the structures telling you something. They're telling you that there is a distance of four angstroms here for this four and a half angstroms, which is the Van der Waals distance. It's the non-bonded attraction of a rhodium for an oxygen. And he can get the von der Waals distances from these graphs. This is an, an incredible piece of work. It took, a, it took a, also a lot of work. I could talk more about it. I could talk about distances forever because I worked with Lipscomb, who was a crystallographer. And one of the things I learned from Professor Lipscomb's group, even though I did not do any crystal structures, what I, was I learned how to tell good from bad crystal structures. And I learned also to, to look at them. I tend to think of myself as a very good observer of crystal structures. Um, and I, I have gotten a lot of inspiration from them. Okay, we must leave distances, even though they were began to be available, as I said, at the time First World War, we have one million structures, we have a lot of information. Let's talk about energies, because from the beginning, the idea of the bond 
had an associated energy. Now, say you want to have, you have ethane, CH3, CH3, and you want the bond energy. So you might think that the easiest and most direct way to get the bond energy is to heat ethane and to see at what point it breaks up into two methyl radicals for the CC bond, an ethyl and the hydrogen for the CH bond. You want both of those. I want both of those. Well, the trouble is that if there are several ways of breaking up, the way that thermal heating works is the weakest bond breaks first. And there is an equilibration of energy among the other things. So it's impossible to get the CH bond energy by heating up ethane. What you can get is the CC bond energy, which turns out to be about 90 kilocalories uh, or about 4 EV per, per bond. So in the intervening period, people have perfected ways of getting other bond energies other than the only one available in a complex molecule by simple thermolysis. And they've gotten this by using uh, Bornmeier cycles uh, on and involving both very often photoionization mass spectrometry. This is how it works. Let me show you one example. Uh, here is ethane. And my goal is to get the CH bond energy of ethane. There is a review here. So the, what you do is you shine light on ethane. The light is in the vacuum UV. This is not visible light. Ethane is colorless. And at some point in the UV, there is a threshold for ethane actually absorbing the light and, wake, and breaking up. And when it breaks up, it goes to ethyl cation and the hydrogen and an electron. It's a photoionization. Um, now, you can measure that very precisely. You can also independently measure the ionization potential of an ethyl radical, CH3, CH2 neutral. Uh, or you can measure the electron attachment. You can generate the ethyl cation in a molecular beam and measure the energy that's released when an electron uh, is taken up by that ethyl cation. That's the reverse of the ionization potential. Of, so you have a check actually from two directions, but you can get this. Now, if you take these two equations, you just add them up, you get the what you want, which is remarkably that you can get the CH bond energy. This is how most bond energies today have been determined. Uh, some are easy, predictable, and uh, they can also be calculated today. And there is an interesting story about modern thermochemical tables are often a combination of experimental and theoretical work. And that's another story. Um, anyway, a CC bond in ethane of 88 kilocalories is weaker than the energy when two CH2s come together with, because of the double bond. There are some surprises which are lots of fun to think about. For instance, that same energy in, uh, for silicon down group 14 is... Uh, very different. The gain in um, a silicon-silicon double bond is not very stable, neither thermodynamically nor kinetically. And there is a story here that's related to uh, the silicon analog of graphene and why that never will be found for freestanding. Uh, so there, there are other things. Silicon is weird and it's not carbon. So this, this points to me 
Silicon is my favorite element because, not because I've done much about it, but because to me, it is the prima facie definition of what is the value of the periodic table. It is the same and not the same. Silicon is like carbon, but it's not like carbon. Here you see it's not like carbon at all. And that's what's interesting. Bond dissociation energies usually correlate with bond distances in a direction that short bonds are strong, of course. And that has been there from the beginning, but it's not always true. Here, is, here are some computed, very good computations, potential energy surfaces for the C2 molecule, which I'm interested in here, not because it has a quadruple bond in the ground state or not, but what I'm interested in is in looking just at the ground and excited states and seeing uh, that in fact, most bonds that are longer equilibrium bond lengths, that's the bottom of these curves, are in fact weaker, but it's not always true. Look at this, look at this one over here. That's an excited state of C2 that has a lower bond energy. That's the energy necessary to knock it apart to two carbon atoms. Lower bond energy than the ground state, but has a shorter bond. Isn't that interesting? And I want to know why, of course. That's why I look at these things. Uh, let's talk about the third measure of uh, bonds, and that is the force constant. So this came also from the beginning, but the general idea is that near the bottom of these potential energy curves for any molecule, you can usually fit a quadratic. Usually, not always. And it's interesting, the cases where you can't are interesting. And that quadratic, there is a force constant. This is the force constant of the spring that gives that molecular vibration. So this is the idea of a two atoms connected by a spring and the force constant of that spring. They're of course related that the force constant goes as the uh, square of the frequency. They're related to each other by a square root along there. There is a reduced mass also. Now this is behind uh, the use of, of infrared spectra by organic chemists for 70, 80 years now. This is a typical spectrum of, as it happens, isopropanol. And the, the, here, for instance, is an OH stretch characteristic. Also, its shape is very interesting. Um, these things have come of prominence. You know, vibrational spectra are even known to the physics community. I'm joking. But what I'm talking about here is that if you look at the information coming in from outer space, this is from the uh, cloud in Sagittarius. You get, if you look at it at sufficient resolution, you will get spectra that look like the two middle panels here. There are thousands if not millions of lines in these. And you look at higher resolution up at the top and at still higher resolution over here. And you can see still many, many lines. So what you have is lots of chemistry going on in these clouds or in the atmospheres, the outer flares and atmospheres especially of brown giants. And people are very interested in these things. Anyway, early on, people tried to calculate, to relate the strength of the bonds to the force constants in such what was called a vibrational analysis. So in a vibrational analysis, what one does is one takes a molecule and one, uh, assumes certain force constants for certain bonds like a CC, a CH, and then calculates the vibrations and compares the vibrations with experiment, which I saw on a, you saw on a previous slide. And then 
gets the force constants which best match the vibrations. This is a grossly underdetermined uh, set of things. Uh, it's very interesting to see people talk about this honestly. These vibrational force fields, I should say, have not been so popular. So I had to go back 50 years to find one to show you. This molecule was made, trimethylene methane, iron tricarbonyl, a very interesting molecule with threefold symmetry with a C with three CH2s above an iron tricarbonyl. The structure was known from an X-ray structure, but someone did a force constant analysis from the uh, detailed measurements of the vibrations. Actually, what happened was two groups did uh, this identical force field analysis. Now, this is just a little side word, a sidebar about when two experimental groups study the same thing, and they really are two different groups. This is, and they publish it, as you see here. This is not a good thing for the second one to, to publish this. But it's the best thing in the world that could happen for the community of chemistry. Because it is only when two groups with their own suppositions and different equipment and different attitudes, only when two groups think that they are doing the same thing, that you get a real estimate of what experimental error means. Oh, they can all do the statistics. They all know the statistics. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the reality of the uh, systematic errors that are hidden that are, that are not in their statistics. And so this was actually a very good thing. And the two groups did have got the force constants. These are these Ks for these, they, another group and them, and many of them differed by two, three percent, but some differed even in sign and were different in substantially. And so one of these was a very honest person, Foyle Miller was a great spectroscopist. And he said, and I want to show this to you. He said, two different valence force fields are now available for this molecule. That of the other paper and ours, both reproduce the scarting frequencies well, but they differ considerably. Is either set right? We believe that most force constants which have been derived from large symmetry blocks should be regarded with skepticism. And then he traces out the uncertainty. He said the different sets will reproduce the frequencies equally well. And sometimes there are two or more sets which seem equally reasonable. It is then almost impossible to tell which is right. One is seldom aware of the existence of these other sets. Uh, big kudos to Foyle Miller for having the courage to say that, and you wish more people would do that. Okay, this triple correlation. Professor Hod. Yes. There is a question for you. Yes. Bertu Lucia is asking, molecular interaction or bond, as he said, is important for energy levels. Yes. Okay. Yes, molecular interaction of bonds. Is it important for the energy levels? I'm not entirely sure what this means. Um, so let's see. Your question presupposes that you start with a localized orbital, with a localized bond orbital picture. And if you do that, Yes, that is a not a very good starting point for some things. But if you start with localized orbitals, then the interaction of bonds with each other is important for the energy of a molecule. Uh, most of the time, the problem is seen in another way, given that calculations are so easy. Now, 
most of the time today, one does the calculation in a very delocalized way, then transforms to localized orbitals. And then people fight with each other whether my localization scheme is better than your localization scheme. That's a brief summary of the literature that's out there. Um, but, um, and uh, by the end of the seminar, the reason they fight will become clear. Uh, please interrupt me again, just like you did. That's good because I am so drunk on my lecturing that I don't <laughs> see the chat picture. Um, so I have to, okay. Okay. This triple correlation of distances, force constants, and energies is called Badger's rule. It is usually valid, but with some exceptions. Uh, so that's all that I'll say is sometimes it fails. Just be aware that this happens. Now let's switch to electron density. So yes, those are available theoretically, but I'm actually talking about experimental electron densities. Today, from low temperature X-ray diffraction experiments, it is possible to get the electron densities in a molecule experimentally. Here for a molecule, methyl carbamide, Phil Coppens, who is no longer alive, but was one of the best crystallographers we had. Uh, please ignore the black lines and the blue lines too. Just look at the red lines if you can. Those are the actual electron densities uh, in this molecule and their contours. But actually, I want to go to something simpler to show you the trouble with these. Here is BF3. BF3 is a nice molecule with uh, D3H symmetry. Here is a plot from a very good calculation, which should be matched by experiment, uh, of the electron density in the plane of the boron three fluorines at left, and in a plane perpendicular to that one that includes a BF bond at right. And what you see is the region of the bond is a minimum of the electron density, not a maximum. So this is where the furniture of the mind has led you astray. This is where you're where a hundred years of seeing a line makes you think there is electron density there. There is, but not nearly as much as we think. So where does the, where are the, what are the peaks of the electron density from in BF3? They are from the cores, of course, from the 1S levels on boron and fluorine and from some of the 2s levels on fluorine, which are also, but they are from the 1s. The 1s level has a, remember the electron density in the 1s level of hydrogen? It goes to a cusp at the nucleus. That's what these do too, the 1s of, of boron and fluorine. So a bond is actually not a region of maximum in electron density along the bond direction, B to F. But it is a maximum in two planes, which are at right angles to that. In the plane that is at right angles, uh, this uh, to the plane, if I were to draw a plane this way, that would be going across this way the electron density does rise in the middle. This is what's, we'll come back to this when we talk about quantum theory of atoms and molecules in the second part. But what this means is that getting at the bonding electron density, uh, once you realize that there isn't that much density to worry about, there is some, but there isn't that much in the bond. 
uh, getting at the electron density, you think it might be simple. So what you do if you want the electron density of, of in an H2 bond is you take the calculated or experimental calculated actually in this case, electron density and you subtract from it. So now what do you subtract from it? So the most obvious thing is to subtract spherical atoms. It's what I would do as the first thing. And when you do that for H2, you get the solid lines mean the buildup of electron density, the dashed lines mean a depletion of electron density, the integrated sum of this of the increases and the depletions is zero. That is, it's just H2 and you're subtracting two neutral atoms and you clearly see a buildup in the region of the bond. And now you do this for F2 with the world's best calculation on F2. And what you find is that in the region of the bond, if you subtract, spherical fluorine atoms. In the region of the bond, there is a depletion of electron density. Now that bond is not strong. It's actually 35 kilocalories only. It's not strong, but it's there. And, and where it, the electron density piles up is in the regions where a chemist would say the lone pairs are. It's bizarre. But what's wrong here is you have not polarized the atoms to prepare them for bonding. And fluorine is, yes, it's 2s2, 2p5. That's the fluorine atom. But that's, but prepared for bonding, it uh, has, it's closer to the chemical picture of having, as, uh, it, of having one hybrid toward the center, uh, which with, uh, with, or you should, the configuration which most enters into bonding is a 2P5 configuration that's not spherically symmetrized, but which is depleted in electrons along the axis so that it can form the bond. Okay. W.H.E. Schwartz has analyzed this in some detail. The upshot of the story is in order to, it all makes sense, but you've got to subtract something that's prepared for bonding. And how do you know what's prepared for bonding? By knowing the final bonding. So there is a, a real circularity built into the system over here. Okay, magnetism, ionization potential, spectroscopy, I don't have too much time, but magnetic criteria in general have been used for analyzing especially weak bonds and especially for inorganic compounds. So the general picture is like this. It's easy to understand. The general picture of this is true for both magnetic and spectroscopic criteria of weak bonding. Uh, here's an example where this is analyzed. This is a two copper atoms with uh, four acetates bridging the copper atoms. You see here as bidentate ligands. And then there's a water at the end and at the, at the top and the bottom. That copper um, is a copper plus two. Copper plus two has got a... Um, a hole in the D block. Uh, and so there is an odd electron in here, actually in an orbital, a D orbital that's pointing toward the ligands. And there is an odd electron and a copper underneath. The two coppers are separated experimentally by a distance that is uh, 2.75 angstroms, just a bit longer than a single bond. Is there a bond between the two coppers? That's the question. Typical inorganic bonding question. It can be often translated into a more complicated question of, 
is the ground state of the molecule high spin or low spin? That's what I'm asking now. Are the two electrons unpaired high spin or are they paired uh, low spin? It also translates in a solid state in the question of ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic coupling. The general picture is like this. There is a bond and an anti-bond. Call those a sigma and sigma star. There are two electrons to be put in there. If the two orbitals are not far from each other, that's what weak bonding means. If the two orbitals are not far, if they're far from each other, you've got a strong bond. There is no question the ground state is a singlet. No one would propose a high spin molecule for a strong bond. Um, but when you two levels are close to each other, then there are four configurations that compete for being the ground state, one of them a triplet and three singlets, six microstates. And uh, if the two levels are very close to each other, usually the triplet wins out uh, and is the ground state. But this is the basic question, and this is how the uh, this orbital splittings and the values of the exchange integrals that are involved here, I'm using theoretical language, but the simple theory behind this, I've, I've essentially said in words, is there and it's used in magnetic criteria. Spectroscopic measures of weak bonding are similar if you have a bond that is a bonding and anti-bonding orbital, two electrons in it, and then if you somehow increase the strength of the bonding, which means split the bonding and anti-bonding levels apart more, you will get a blue shift of the first electronic transition, which is promoting one electron to the other uh, level. And this is, uh, I am not doing justice to this. I have, in my own work, I've done this because I want to finish the first part. And that comes with my talking about STM. STM, scanning tunneling microscopy, an incredible technique coming out from the mid nineties where you take a tip, typically it was tungsten in the beginning and you can maneuver the trip that tip relative to a conducting surface and you could put a molecule on it and you measure the, uh, the tunneling current through whatever molecules on top of this or just from the surface. And you have exquisite control to angstrom, tenth of an angstrom scale in all three dimensions in jamming it into the surface and in laterally moving it along the surface. And the first pictures were incredible of an unusual reconstruction on a surface of silicon called a silicon 111 surface. Because this was done at IBM, <clears throat> from the beginning, there was an extraordinary amount of hype attached to this because it was done at a company. Not that, not that scientists working for themselves are incapable of generating hype. They are helped by the public affairs office of their universities. But in this case, a company, IBM did it. And so <clears throat> what the advertising typically said is now after 2000 years of waiting, you can finally see atoms. Well, I went through the ceiling when I heard that because <clears throat> that scanning tunneling microscope would not have been built if it were not for 200 years of chemistry, which worked hard and combined the fallible experiments, our tools, with our equally fallible minds in a active, social activity called science in order to gain in not deniable evidence of how atoms were connected to each other. I'll show you, we didn't need the STM to know the structure of a molecule. And 
for God's sakes, give proper credit where it's due. And that is to knowing without seeing. Okay? That's in a way what we did. It doesn't mean we didn't do science, but we just didn't see the atoms. But we knew they were there. I think that's much more interesting than seeing them. I also think that knowing without seeing is an important bridge between science and the humanities. This is another story um, to talk about. So what's the situation now, 25 years after this development? Situation is sort of like this. Here is a model at lower left of a thalocyanine molecule uh, a, in a crystal, four of them. And what you see is in the STM today is something like this. You don't have, in the STM pictures, you don't have very good resolution. Actually, what you see in the STM is something in a way much more interesting than the atoms. Because what you are observing is a tunneling current. <clears throat> and you set the bias of the tip from the plate underneath. So you can tunnel out of filled levels of whatever molecules on the plate. Or there is a certain inverse experiment where you can actually probe unfilled levels of the molecule on there. And so what you see here at lower right is the pentacene molecule in an STM and this is with the bias set about two or something, two to three EV below the Fermi level, below the level of conductivity. So what you are seeing here is contours of the electron density from the molecular orbital, which is occupied, which is not the HOMO, not the highest occupied molecular orbital but some lower molecular orbital. You can go through the molecular orbitals and get a plot of psi squared of a molecule. And that's very interesting. Now, things have happened since then. Atomic force microscope, microscopy has developed stronger and it often today has something else at the tip. And one of the things they've gotten on a tip that's proven very useful is a carbon monoxide molecule. They pick it up from the surface and then they move over and they sweep it over a pentacene molecule. And you get, what you get is actually a repulsion, a map of the repulsion of the oxygen for the atoms underneath, you get picture of that repulsion like this, and then you massage it through some programs to get the picture that you see at the bottom. And these are the pictures that are published. Uh, they are bright in some parts, and it does it certainly looks like the molecule that you know it is. And you can run even a set of reactions with this. Here is a remarkable paper from 2016, where dibromoanthracene, here you see anthracene with these weird lining up of the ends, two bromines here, and then it, uh, one bromine is pushed off and you can actually see the radical. This is incredible, incredible in some way. And then you see the di radical with both bromines off, and then you see a rearrangement actually an electrocyclic opening of a polyene to give another ring. Uh, when you see this, you, uh, you, uh, you are just full of wonder what you get until you start asking the question. And that is, what are you seeing, actually? It is not a map of the electron density, uh, but it's something related. And I'm not sure to this day I understand what I'm seeing, though I've tried very hard to understand. And if someone shows you these pictures in a seminar, please ask, what are you measuring? Uh, because it is actually very interesting. 
Um, now, I just want to be sure. This here is a picture of pentacene in the middle, obtained from atomic force microscopy and worth three papers in Science and Nature, okay? In 2016 to 2020. Down at the bottom is the X-ray crystal structure of pentacene from a paper in 1949, which gives you slightly more significant figures than are uh, permissible here really by the experiment, but which gives you the metrics of the molecule. So which is worth more to you? I think it's pretty clear. Uh, <laughs> the crystal structure yes. is, gives you more metric information on this. We are at the end of my first part. I just want to leave with you uh, while we have an intermission. This picture detailed from Raphael's fresco in the Vatican Library, the school of philosophers as Plato and Aristotle in the middle, and uh, he could not be sure that even his learned audience of priests in the Vatican Library would know who was Plato and who was Aristotle. So he gives each other a book and you can read that he, Aristotle is Ethica and Plato has here, uh, I think it's Timaeus uh, over here. So they would know who is who by their books they have written. And you see here, up there, that's Plato pointing to the ideal forms that are the underlying reality. Down here is Aristotle. We think of Aristotle, um, of Aristotle having led physics astray. He didn't lead physics astray. He was a very careful observer of nature, uh, remarkable observations for his time. But to me, Aristotle here stands for experiment and Plato for theory up there. So we better go on. After a break for five minutes, we will be back, okay? Okay, Professor, but before that, there is another question for you. Yes. They are asking, it's about uh, carbon and silicon. How would symmetry affect the bonds between carbon and silicon and their electron density? Um, indirectly, the effect of symmetry. So the story very briefly can be traced. The, the story has to do with the instability of pi bonding in silicon-silicon. Uh, the sigma bonding is okay as we can see from that bond strength. Um, also silicon has, is, has an extraordinary bond strength to oxygen and that more stronger than carbon, which is also strong. Uh, so that silicon oxygen bonding is especially strong. Uh, the silicon, the symmetry, I, I would tend to say affects it only indirectly. It has more to do with the difference in energy between 3s and 3p of silicon relative to 2s and 2p of carbon. And then it has to do with the overlaps between two silicon atoms between the relative strengths of 2s, 2s, and 2s, 2p sigma overlaps of the of the atoms with each other. Those are, the, to me, the main qualitative factors that govern this. Okay. Okay, we stop for five minutes. Yes. Thank okay. you.